I'd like for my name to appear in someone's testimonial. And it's so easy to do that. You don't have to give lectures and seminars. If you just recommend a book, you know, that changed your financial future, recommend a book that helped you set goals, recommend a book that uh, turns your life around, uh, recommend a book that uh, created better health. And you just pass that along to someone at a Tuesday breakfast, right? And someone later says, you know that book you recommended, I'm telling you, that started me reading and then I read another one and here's what's happened to me. Uh, here's what's happened to me financially, socially, personally, and it all goes back two years ago, three years ago, when we had that Tuesday morning breakfast and you recommended that book. So it's pretty easy for your name to appear in someone's testimonial. And I get great delight in traveling around the world and having that happen for me. Now someone says, Mr. Rohn, 20 years ago, 30 years ago, uh, I sat in your seminar, you shared some ideas, here's what's happened to me, my family, my income. A man not long ago showed me the notes he took 23 years earlier. And he said, Mr. Rohn, I've used these notes all these years in my business life, my personal life, my family. He said, I've made my fortune. And he said, I want to thank you for these notes. And he had me sign them after 23 years. It was just incredible. And he said, when I took these notes, I was uh, 18 years old. So he was just a teenager sitting in the audience taking all these notes, but the notes he kept for 23 years. And it was such great pleasure and excitement for me to sign those notes. So when your name appears in someone's testimonial, it's very exciting. Now, he was only 18 years old, so make this the second note of your notes for today. You never know who may be in your audience. You just don't know. Say, well, just a teenager, but we can't say just a teenager. We have to say each individual is important. So if you have a chance to share, here's what's important. Always do your best. Always be sincere. And always tell as much of your story as you can to help someone else. Because you never know who you're talking to. Right? The next person that may be a friend for life. The next person that may be a business associate for a long, long time. So just have great respect for everybody. And then sincerely tell your story or recommend a book or share an idea. Because sure enough, a week from then, a year from then, years later, uh, your name will appear in their testimonial. But it's fun for me to travel around the world. Where have I been recently? Just got back from Mexico. Before that, where? Japan and other parts of that part of the world. I've been lecturing around the world now for about 27 years. It's very exciting. And it's going to be fun today to do this uh, seminar without any translation. <laughs> it's, you know, translation is really kind of tough. I've learned how to do it, and it's a lot of fun for me, but it is hard work. It's just some things make sense in English that don't make sense in another language, so you have to deal with that. I go to Japan for the first time in Tokyo, and I said to my audience, he was all bent out of shape. And my translator said, you know, wouldn't have a clue how to translate that in uh, Japanese for it to make sense. So it's interesting. Years ago, I went to Taiwan for the first time. And to the Chinese, I said, he blew his top. And my Chinese translator said, it wouldn't look good in Chinese. So, <laughs> you know, what can you do? It's, it's really challenging. But uh, it's exciting for me, you know, regardless of the language. Now, what's really challenging is when you have more than one language. You know, you do a convention and there's 19 languages and everybody's got the headphones on. That is challenging. Uh, because sometimes there's a delay in some of the translations for each of the languages. It's, it's amazing. You know, you hit the punchline, the Spanish get it first and then the French get it and then the uh, <laughs> Italians get it. You know, finally the Germans get it. No, some languages take a little longer to translate, so, uh, you know, it seems like they're a little slow catching on, but uh, not true. It's really just the translation. And then I've got this one translator who's been with me for years and years from Mexico, and he's gotten so good now. When you have one language, uh, you have what we call consecutive translation instead of simultaneous. So you say a couple of sentences, and the translator translates. Say a couple of sentences, translator translates. Well, he was with me the last time in Spain... And I would say a couple of sentences, and he would go on and on and on and on. And I said, hold it, you're doing your own seminar here, <laughs> leaving me out. But anyway, it's exciting. But today, 
I'm not burdened with translation, so it's just going to be very exciting for me. And I'm just delighted about this chance to come by for a couple of days. Here's what's exciting for me, to spend two whole days so that we've got some time. You know, when I give a convention speech one hour, it it isn't much time. And then I have a one-day seminar, three, four hours. That seems to be so short. So this is really my favorite a way to lecture and, and uh, deliver my messages in the two-day, where we've got plenty of time to take good notes, plenty of time to ask some questions at the break, uh, talk things over this evening with some friends maybe that you've come with, come back tomorrow, we'll gain some more momentum, and it's just going to be very exciting. So time is running out, right, uh, for the 20th century. I'd like to have you make these notes. Number one, how to be prepared for the 21st century. A lot of the things I'm going to cover these two days is going to have that woven into it, being ready for the next century. But here's just a couple of thoughts up front. Number one, I would suggest you have multiple skills. Learn more than one skill to be prepared for the next century. We've watched people, right, with only one skill the last 15 years. The company got downsized. Their division got chopped. Right? The guy lost his job, and he's now vulnerable because he only had one skill. So this would be a bit of wise advice, you know, take some extra classes and get prepared for the next century by being multi-talented and having more than one skill. Uh, I started developing multiple skills at age 25. They made me a millionaire by age 31, six years later. Uh, Part of it was investments and part of it was good luck, but I really revolutionized my whole financial program by learning more than one skill. You know, if a guy that just works on the line for the last 15 years, if he would have taken accounting or something two nights a week, you know, for the last two, three years, he'd have something to fall back on, something extra. But anyway, that's good advice, more than one skill for the 21st century. Here's number two. Wouldn't hurt to learn more than one language. Multiple languages now are so, pay off so big. Some of my business colleagues around the world that speak three or four languages, you know, they make three or four million dollars a year instead of three or four hundred thousand. Those extra languages serve them so well. It's incredible. One of my Israeli friends speaks six languages. Michael has command of six languages. Now he's learning number seven. It is so much fun to travel around the world with him because he can talk to everybody. I mean, you know, he orders all the food, and it doesn't matter what country you're in. He talks to everybody and makes all the arrangements. It is such a luxury. It is such a powerful thing to have the command of all these uh, extra languages. My father spoke German uh, when I was growing up, but he never taught me. You know, I could have learned German easy, but they were trying to get away from the old world languages when I was growing up, right? My mother spoke French. She's English, but she spoke French. But she never taught me the French, and I could have learned three languages in the same time I learned one if it would have struck them that maybe these extra languages would be so valuable. But back then, they said, you know, leave the old world behind, the old languages. This is America now. We all speak English. But what an advantage for me that would have been if I would have had those extra two languages. So that's part of my advice. Multiple skills, multiple languages. I asked a school teacher one time, how many languages can a child learn? Here's what she said, as many as you will teach them. They don't lack the capacity. They don't lack the intelligence. They certainly don't lack the curiosity. All they lack is a teacher. So remember that too with your children. Encourage them to learn that second, third language. Because the world is getting smaller and smaller. You know, it's unbelievable. I fly around the world now so easy. Uh, Fourteen hours later from Los Angeles, I'm in Tokyo. Someone asked me, was it a tough trip? I said, no, five meals, three movies, and you're there. (laughs) Right? I mean, (laughs) how easy can it possibly be? I fly the Concorde. The Concorde, three hours from London to New York. It's incredible. The world is getting so small. If you fly the Concorde, you can have breakfast in Paris, lunch in London, and dinner in New York all on the same day. It's staggering. Uh, If you fly the Concorde, you can see two sunsets in one day. If you're in London, you watch the sun go down. 
When you get to New York, you get to watch it go down the second time. You got to try that. It's, <laughs> it's unbelievable. You've always heard that the sun always comes up in the east. Not true. Not true. If you fly the Concorde west at 1,300 miles an hour, the sun comes up in the west. It is one of the most awesome sights to see, the sun coming up in the west. Incredible. So put that on your goal list. We're going to talk more about that tomorrow. Watching the sun come up in the west. Amazing. So anyway, uh, the new century, let me give you my uh, opinion of the next century, the next millennium. A new century, a new decade, 10 years, a new century, 100 years, and a new millennium, 1,000 years. We've had six millenniums of written history. We're about to enter the seventh. Some scholars hold great significance to this seventh millennium, that it's going to be a unique and dramatic time, and probably that's probably true. Technology, transportation, communication, it's unbelievable what's happened up until now, especially the last 100 years, especially the last 50 years. So here's what we started in the late part of this century, and it's a good note to make. What we hope is advanced civilization. The beginning of civilization says, let us learn to restrain the dark side of our nature, which everybody has. Who was it said? Power corrupts, right? And absolute power tends to corrupt absolutely. So to become a civilized society, here's what we must do. Start early. You have to start with your own children to develop a civilized society. If a three-year-old hits another three-year-old over the head, if he's not restrained to become civilized, he will do it again. And if he's not further restrained, he may enjoy it. Now we have the beginning of a major uncivilized problem. So here's what civilization is. The restraint of power in its beginning form. And we must start with our own children to civilize our own. We say, well, our children live in a civilized society. Yes, but when they're born, soon after, not too long after, they must be restrained. They must be taught what we call civilized behavior. Now, that goes right on up the line. The misuse of power is, is everywhere. A father may misuse his power and force his children to live in his shadow instead of in the sunlight of opportunity. It is called the misuse of power. And it doesn't matter whether it's a father or a three-year-old child. We must all be taught that to live in a civilized society and bless the next generation and the next generation, we must be taught civilized behavior because only can we flourish and grow in a civilized situation. It's very important. Even the government must restrain its power. That's why we have in America, make the note, three branches of government. Why three branches? Here's one of the main reasons. So that one doesn't become all-powerful. This is an interesting study, civilized behavior. We have what we call checks and balances. Because without these checks, anything that gains some power, there's a, sometimes an unrestrained appetite for more power and then the use of power. And sometimes at the beginning, not with sinister motives, but just because you're powerful. And somebody must say, hey, 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 this is not the deal. So we have three branches of government so that the power is more diversified and it doesn't fall into the hands of just one. After the Constitution was written, it didn't seem to be sufficient. Here's what was added to the Constitution, what? The Bill of Rights. To do what? To protect citizens from the power of their own government. You say, well, wouldn't the government love and respect its citizens? Guess what's tempting? Power. Power is tempting. 
And once you've got it, that's why the great prayer says, you know, lead us around, right? Which is probably a, an excellent modern day translation. Lead us around temptation. Right? Here's a tempting billboard. Lead us around so we don't see it. Right? Lead us around temptation so that we escape it to the best of our ability. Because once you have power, it's tempting. So the Bill of Rights was to restrain the government in its use of power against its own citizens. We even have laws that protect the customer from the salesperson. Do you believe that? You say, well, wouldn't all salespeople love and respect their customers? <laughs> say, well, surely freedom means, you know, hey, everybody will do the right thing. Say, well, we probably should build some jails. Yes, we got a new country, but not everybody is going to follow what we call civilized behavior. So we do have to have certain restraints. And that's meant to punish those who misuse their power, and it's also to alert those that there are certain limits, certain limits to power. So here's number one. Civilized behavior is, is the mission of all of us. Civilized behavior for ourselves. We must not let ourselves be tempted to misuse our power whether you're in management or whether, wherever you are. There's always the temptation to misuse your power, but to have a civilized office, to have a civilized company, to live in a civilized community, the majority, and thank God so far, the majority has decided that the civilized way is the best way to raise our families and build cities and conquer disease and educate right, our future generations. Civilized behavior. Now here's the ultimate, civilized behavior among nations. Americans find it strange, this thing called ethnic cleansing. That's strange behavior. In America, where would we start? <laughs> ethnic cleansing? Guess what's made America powerful? The blending, the commitment of many ethnic streams that have come to America over the last 200 years. No country has been such a depository of the gifts of the world like America the last 200 years. For 200 years, people have come from all over the world to America, bringing with them their recipes and their food <laughs> and what? Their music and their dance and their artistic ability, right? The gift of law and the gift of government and the gift of medicine and the gift of healing and the gift of religion and the gift of the work ethic. All of this didn't start here. All of it came here from all the countries of the world. It's an incredible list of how many people outside the country like Japan, the most Japanese outside of Japan live in America, right? The most Italians outside of Italy live in America. The most Koreans outside of Korea live in America. The most Puerto Ricans outside of Puerto Rico live in America. You can go right down the list, country after country. The list is so long, it's unbelievable. But that's what's made America so unbelievably powerful. The contribution of all the ethnic streams that have been coming here for 200 years. It's incredible. So we think it's incomprehensible to misuse your power to do what they would call ethnic cleansing that we don't want the mixing, we've got to put up the walls and the partition so that this nationality lives on this side and this one lives on this side. Incredible. Now here's hopefully what the nations will do. Instead of fighting each other for what they want, is to negotiate. See, if you've got the wheat and I've got the oil, I try to kill you for your wheat and you try to kill me for my oil, uh, maybe someday sanity will prevail and we sit down and say, wait a minute, what if I gave you some of my oil and you gave me some of your wheat? And we could spare all this fighting and all the bloodshed. Great idea. So we turn then to negotiation. Now here's the ultimate in the nations working together, hopefully for the 21st century to provide unprecedented opportunity. And that's not just negotiating, but cooperating. When I was in Russia, overhead was the space station, which is about now to fall out of the sky and get burned up. But guess who was on the space station? Russians and Americans. I mean, it's a brand new world. It's a, in the last 20, 25 years, it is so staggering what's happened around the world. 
So, make the note, unprecedented opportunity. If we hold it all together, if we help each other in learning that civilized behavior, whether it's nations or whether it's individuals or whether it's companies or whatever it is, that the hope for the future of the world in the 21st century is civilized behavior at every level, from our children to the neighborhood to the city to the state to the country and the nations of the world. So if that holds together, which it looks good, I think we've got the best chance ever in the last 6,000 years. We've got the best chance, the early years of the 21st century, to build a unique society in America and make a unique contribution to the whole world. We all hope for that. We pray for it. Now, unprecedented opportunity. But here's the next part of the 21st century. Make this note. Keen competition. But what else is new? Once you open up opportunity, now we bring competition. But here's what competition does. Refines opportunity so that the flow of goods and services and ideas and things and values to the marketplace becomes absolutely unprecedented. And a big share of that comes from friendly competition. Friendly competition. But competition is what creates new, new goods and services. Competition creates new ways and means looking for a way to better serve the public, that kind of competition. So here's what you must be prepared for, opportunity and competition. Here's what America now has a chance to play, the world game, right? The world game of economics, making a contribution and getting out there and competing with our technology and our muscle and our brains and our intelligence and everything else we've got. We bring all of that to bear into the 21st century. And America's got a good chance a good chance to win a unique share of, of the world market with our ability to not only learn languages, not only learn skills and be ready for all of that, but uh, to learn to compete fairly, but to compete. Get up early, stay up late, come up with a new idea, go, go, go. That is my view of the 21st century. It's an exciting time to be alive. I think this is the best time ever in the 6,000 year history of mankind, best time ever to be alive. You can do so many unique things now with your life. Okay, now make these notes, what I hope you find here in this two day seminar. I wanna fill up your notebook. Here's really what I wanna do. Take what's in my notebook and my notes and get it in your notebook. Take what's in my head, get it in your head, what's in my heart, hopefully get it in your heart. Then here's what I want you to promise me that you'll pass it on to somebody else. Can I see your hands promised? Okay. Okay, then I will continue. I will. <laughs> because that's what's interesting. I, I, I haven't come just to do a seminar and get paid because I don't need the money. Okay, I take the money, but you know, I don't need the money. Because <laughs> I made my fortune a long time ago. But here's what I do need. I do need to know that my stuff lives on. That's why it's so exciting for me when somebody shows me the notes they took 23 years ago. I say, wow, for this stuff to hang around and to serve somebody, you know, when I'm off doing something else, the ideas are still working in someone's life. It's gone from somebody's notebook to someone else's notebook and someone else's notebook. So make this note. With ideas, you can affect the lives, directly and indirectly, of thousands, tens of thousands, and maybe for some of you, millions of people. Directly and indirectly. You can affect the lives of dozens of people, hundreds of people, some of you thousands of people, because the ideas you share won't be lost. They'll be invested in someone else who will pass them on, who will pass them on. Because, you know, some have come my way and gone on to do much bigger things than I've done. Tony Robbins sat in my seminar when he was 17. 17, he was on the outs with his parents and he was sleeping in his car. And someone got him to come to my seminar, age 17. So you, don't, you never know who's in the audience. And he worked for me for three and a half years promoting my seminars, back then called Adventures in Achievement. Three and a half years. Finally ran one of my offices at age 20 in Los Angeles, Tony Robbins. Now he's a big time superstar, bigger superstar than I am around the world. Unbelievable. And he mastered all the stuff. You know, I didn't teach him to fire walk and all that stuff, but <laughs> that's Tony style. You know, he can get by with that. I couldn't do that. <laughs> I did say to him one time, Tony, you've got to do water instead of fire. They'll come from all over the world.
And knowing Tony, guess what? He'll probably try it. <laughs> it. Kid's unbelievable. He's unbelievable. But around the world, now he's, he's a bigger superstar than I am, you know, by multiplied by who knows how many times. But see, that's very exciting for me. Here's what it does. And you might make this note because you can do it with your children and, you know, we can do it physically through our, uh, our children, grandchildren, and on down the line. A chance for immortality. Another chance for immortality. When your ideas live on, your influence lives on in someone else, and then the next generation and the next generation. It's also possible for the evil to pass generation after generation. The old prophet said what? Sometimes the sins of the father have been visited on the second and the third and the fourth generation. It takes the fourth generation to finally get rid of some things that were started back in the first generation. But also the positive influence can be visited on the second, third, fourth generation. No telling how far. You know, I've written so far, what, about five books. I have a vision someday. A hundred years from now, when I'm gone, somebody's up in an attic going through a, a box of old dusty books. And there's one of my books, Seasons of Life. They blow off the dust. Say, wow, this is an interesting book. And it affects their life. And then maybe they use it as a textbook to teach other people. A hundred years from now, after I'm long gone. And do you know what this gives me? A a chance for a little more immortality. To live on, right, in some unique manner long after I'm gone. Okay? This is why teaching is so incredible. And this is why the greatest art in the world, the art of parenting, is so important. So that your influence can live on, live on. Not just in your children, but the the people that your children influence. And not just their children, not just your children and your grandchildren, but the people they influence. Right? The people your sons and your daughters influence, the people your grandchildren influence. So that the ideas that you stuck with and that you taught and that you carefully made sure they were nurtured in the minds and hearts and souls of your children, they go on and on and on. Okay. How long ranging is the impact of an idea? And the answer is infinitely. It can go as far as you can imagine ideas, influence. Okay. So that's why I love to do seminars and have someone say, you know, a year ago, Mr. Rohn, five years ago, ten years ago. And I'm doing my best to improve and get better. I don't want the day to come when someone says, you should have heard Jim Rohn ten years ago when he was really terrific. (laughs) I don't want that to happen. I want someone to say, hey, I heard him 10 years ago, but you should hear him now, right? He's taken off some of the sharp edges. He's, you know, gotten a little better, you know, reaching in the heart and soul. Okay, here's what I hope you'll find here. Number one, sincerity. Above all else, sincerity. Because powerful things can happen when... Both the listener and the speaker are sincere. And I know you're sincere in being here or you wouldn't have shelled out this kind of cash. (laughs) So the pay gives some indication you're sincere. But here's more important than the pay, your time. It's one thing to ask you for your money. And it wasn't that much money, but here was the big request to spend a couple of days. See, that's big time. Money's now small time because everybody's doing well. But here's what's big time, and that's time. So make the note, time is more valuable than money. You can get more money, but you can't get more time. When you spend a day, you've got one less day to spend. To ask me to come and spend two days at this time in my life, see, that's big time. No, it's it's big time. Thank you. Because how many weekends have I got left? You know, not an unlimited supply. You know, and, and when you get, it finally dawned on me the other day that I was now working on the second half of my life. That's an interesting revelation. I'm working on the second half. So that, you, you begin to realize just a weekend is very valuable because you don't have an unlimited supply. Sometimes we get faked out just by the language. Somebody says, well, I, you know, I got 20 more years. Jot this down. You've got 20 more times. When you say years, it's a little bit of a fake out. If you go fishing once a year, you've only got 20 more times to go fishing. 
20 more times to go fishing if you go once a year. So sometimes you get, oh, 20 more years. No, 20 more times, 20 more times. To make each time what? Very valuable if there's a limited supply, a limited supply. So with my limited supply, you know, these days are very valuable for me. You know, I could be spending this time with my children, my grandchildren, and, you know, doing something else rather than spending it with you. But this is part of my life. My family knows that this is such an important part of my life that they loan me, actually, for a couple of days. But guess what they're going to ask me when this two-day seminar is finished? Papa, was it worth it? to take two whole days and go spend those two days with someone else besides us. And I've got to give them a good report. (laughs) So take notes like crazy, you know, even if you have to fake it, right? So I can uh, tell my kids, no, everybody leaned forward, no telling how many stories are going to come rolling out of the two-day seminar, because my my family gets excited about the stories, you know, of people affected by what I do, because they, you know, they enjoy that part of my life as well. But anyway, sincerity. Here's a good point to make, though. Jot this note down. This, this is important. Sincerity is not a test of truth. I hope you will find me sincere. But sincerity is not a test of truth. We must not make this mistake in saying, he must be right, he's so sincere. See, that would be a mistake. Here's why. Why? It's possible to be sincerely wrong. Sincerity is not a test of truth. Make the note, the only test of truth is truth, not sincerity. But hopefully these two days you'll find me both truthful and sincere, truthful to the best of my ability. Here's as close as we can get to the truth as we see it. That's about as close as we can get. You say, well, this is absolutely true. No, it's it's what you think is absolutely true. It's your perception of what might be absolutely true. It's just difficult for any one person to get to the absolute truth. Uh, But we all have an idea. We all have a perception. So I'm going to try to be as truthful as as I possibly can with you today in my perception of what I think is good what I think is a good idea, what I think is a a, a unique idea, what I think is a workable idea. I'm going to get as close to being totally sincere in believing that I've got something valuable and good. But now, here's the ultimate. Each must judge for themselves as to the absolute truth or the truth as it may apply to you and become workable in your experiences. Because that's what we're all after, something that will become workable in our financial experiences, in our sales experiences, in our management experiences, in our parenting experiences, in our daily living experiences. We want things that become useful and practical and that lead us from one step to the next step, that opens a door that may open a wide vista of opportunity we haven't discovered before. That's what we're all looking for. Sometimes we're looking for that fourth number. Right? The lock has got four numbers, and you've already got three probably before you got here. And maybe, just maybe, this seminar will give you that fourth number. And the tumbler then falls in place, and the lock comes open. But you've got to have all four numbers. And as best as I can share with you some things in these two days, it'll give you an insight into something that's practical, something that'll give you another step to take, another way to look at it that might be refreshing in its uh, apparent opportunity or potential opportunity. And if I can just do that, stir your curiosity to look at something like I see it, and I can only give you my, this seminar from my point of view. Someone the other day said, Mr. Rowan, your your seminar is sort of from the man's point of view. And I said, I hope so. It's, it's, It's difficult for me to do it any other way. Now, you've got to listen to the man's point of view. Then you've got to listen to the woman's point of view. You've got to listen to the youth's point of view. You've got to listen to the senior citizen's point of view. Because it's like reading a novel. If you read a novel as a teenager, it, it has certain meanings, certain value. When you get in your 20s and you read the same novel, guess what? You start seeing things you couldn't see as a teenager because it didn't apply. Then you read the same novel in your 30s, and I'm telling you, it starts to really change 
you're beginning to say, now I understand what the author was really trying to show. I can see it now. In my teens, it was a story. In my 30s, it's an application to my life. And then in your 40s and your 50s, all of this starts to change from perspective, a lot of it depending on where you are. Right? Hearing the same idea from a different age perspective now starts to add a new dimension, a new color, some new insight that you didn't have when you were younger. I took my stepson. We went on our motorcycles once up in Clear Lake, up on the Jeep trails. It's one of my hobbies. One of my pastimes is to ride my, my motorcycle up on the Jeep trails. And I had Bruce with me. Bruce and I are riding along on the Jeep trails, and we stopped to take a little rest take our helmets off, take our gloves off, relax a little bit, and the sun was just starting to go down. And it was one of the most magnificent sights up there on the Jeep trails above Clear Lake. It was so spectacular. And I said, Bruce, look at this. Isn't this fantastic? And he looked, he's watching, he said, you know, it's getting late. We better go. <laughs> and I thought, how come he's not dazzled like I am by this sunset? Then it occurred to me, he was only 12. <laughs> And guess how many colors you've got on your palette to paint these pictures in the unique recesses of your mind? Just a few when you're 12. You haven't got all the different shades to paint these unique pictures in, in your consciousness to see something, right? You're limited in colors at age 12. But as time passes and your experience begins to grow, when someone says, see it, you know, a long time ago, you couldn't see it. Why? Not enough colors, not enough vocabulary mental vocabulary, inner vocabulary to translate it for you. So you could only see it in a limited way. But as time passes, that's one of the advantages of age. That's one of the advantages of maturity. That's one of the advantages of living long enough to look at something at age 50 instead of age 5, to look at something at age 40 instead of age 10. The difference can be magnificent if you continue your self-education so that you learn to appreciate the wide range of what's happening in the world and around you in every subject possible. So, age 12, limited colors on the palette to paint pictures on your consciousness. But as time passes, and hopefully for all of you, what I'm about to share with you these two days will have a multi-dimensional possibility for you. One is because I'm expressing them to you at my current age. I probably couldn't have begun to express what I'm going to express for you these last two days, uh, 25, 30 years ago. Couldn't have done it. Didn't have the vocabulary. Didn't have the refinement. Didn't have the experience. Hadn't been to Russia teaching capitalism. So with all of that mixed in with what I'm going to share these two days, hopefully it's, it's, a, it's a lot more multidimensional perspective. This is the end of this disc. The program continues on the next CD. CD.